Hi, everyone. Good afternoon again. Um, nice of, to have some of you here. In this um, discussion, I want to, and I always have to say this out first because uh, it matters to some people. The goal of this presentation is to help you overcome big obstacles politically uh, in your community. And this is not necessarily uh, required in some communities. There are some communities where the shelter directors and the city management and the city government <clears throat> are already interested in saving lives and already want you to help them and already want um, you to, uh, to, to do off-site adoptions or to help them do a foster program and things like that. In our community, that's not where we were in 2005 when we started advocating for No Kill in Austin. And so the idea is, from this presentation, is to learn as much as you can from the things we did right, also learn from the things that we did wrong, and hopefully kind of fast forward through some of the mistakes that we made so that in your community, you can overcome obstacles and political challenges much faster. And the reason I say that at the beginning is because sometimes uh, I see shelter directors come in here, and um, unless they have a city council that doesn't want them doing no-kill, they probably would prefer to be in another room because this is really about overcoming um, administrative, bureaucratic, and political burdens and challenges to uh, achieving no-kill in a community. By the way, these were two cats, two kittens that my wife and I fostered for Austin Pets Alive. So why, uh, why me? Why am I giving this presentation? Well, again, the idea is we've been doing this for a long time in Austin. We started politically advocating for animals in 2004, 2005. So we've been doing it a long time and we've made a lot of mistakes. And we've had some successes. The idea is, again, hopefully you can mirror our successes and avoid our mistakes and get to the end goal a lot faster than we did. We did have some major successes. Uh, the city council mandated to implement the no-kill equation in Austin. They mandated that the city uh, shelter had to do that. We mandated the end of convenience killing, which was the idea that we would kill animals despite the fact that we had empty cages because it was simply more convenient for staff to kill them than to save them. We had uh, a leadership change in Austin that we demanded for a long time that finally happened when our shelter director was reassi reassigned to another department. And uh, and I mentioned this earlier at the earlier session, uh, we had a huge, huge fight in Austin over where we were going to put our new animal shelter. And although we lost, ultimately we got a considerable compromise, which was that the city did what everyone else was saying, telling them to do and moved the shelter to the outskirts of town where nobody lived and worked. But the city resolved to keep open the downtown adoption, a downtown shelter as the adoption center. So in, in, in a way they kind of split the baby. They gave the major stakeholders what they wanted, which was a shelter out in the middle of nowhere. They gave us what we wanted, which was an adoption center where people actually go work, play, um, and shop. So we've, we have achieved some significant successes. You saw this in the, in the last presentation in 2005. We had no foster program, no offsite adoptions. We, had a, we did not have a shelter director who was interested in saving lives. We had an official save rate of 50% and the number of animals killed was 14,304. In 2011, all of those things switched. Uh, less than 2,000 animals were killed in 2011 out of 20 to 25,000 that were coming in every year. And it's gone down every year since then. We are now, I think, uh, the high, we are the highest save rate of any major city in the country. We are the largest city. I also was um, photographed for the cover of one of the local newspapers. <laughs> which I'll talk about a little in this presentation, which is that when you are that crazy shirtless dancing guy out on the side saying, we need to change, we need to change, and you're talking about SPCAs, you become the bad guy. And you're going to get shot at, and you're going to get criticized. And the local newspaper um, was not an exception to the rule. Um, the, this article uh, on the front page, it said, um, off, th off their chains, animal advocates are at each other's throats. And um, we're pretty sure that was supposed to be me. <laughs> uh, at the time, I was working for a law firm in Dallas, and I called them that morning, and I'm like, well, I'm a partner now at my law firm. But at the time, I wasn't, and I, I called my boss, and I just said, I, I feel like I kind of have to warn you that 
there's possibly a caricature of me with a wolf's head on the cover of the local newspaper. And they were like, there's no way it's you. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. And I sent them the picture, and they called me back, and they said, oh, yeah, that's you. <laughs> <laughs> but the whole article um, was about how Ellen and I are horrible people. That was, it was like 10 pages of about how Ellen Jefferson and I are just horrible, hor horrible human beings and how um, we're, you know, it's so immoral to, to demand more of our shelter that's doing such a wonderful job and do hard work, so hardworking. And to be true, you know, to be real, there were some people at the shelter that were hardworking, but their goals were not the same as our goals. And whenever, when people say to you, everybody wants the same thing, that's a lie. Everybody does not want the same thing. Some people want the status quo to be repeated over and over and over again. And they want to keep their jobs and they want to go home at the end of the day and they don't want to work any harder than they have to work. And some people want dramatic change in animal sheltering. We don't all want the same thing. And unfortunately, when you criticize, I mean, it's like criticizing the military or criticizing the police department or the fire department. Uh, when you criticize a group that people love, like the SPCA or the animal shelter, um, you're going to get a target on your back. And, and um, I've told th that to so many people over the years, and it's hard to believe at first. Um, and then a few years later, they'll call me, and they'll say, you know what, you were right about that. And thank you for saying that, because, because I wouldn't, it didn't hurt as much when I knew it was coming. You know, one of the newspapers, the other, new this was the weekly newspaper, the daily newspaper, I had an ed editorial one day which basically called our group out by name and said that we were um, you know, horrible and um, uh, radical and not rational. And it, it's really hard for groups uh, who have historically supported these you know, angel groups to even consider the idea that something could be done better or differently or it could be improved. And people get really, really defensive in, especially in this arena when you say, no, I think, I think we can do better, because they see it as you criticizing them individually. And they consider it as you suggesting that they are to blame for killing, which they are, but they don't want to hear that. And so they'd much rather shut you down and criticize you and attack you, and that's, that's what happened to us in Austin, certainly. Here's the framework for what I'm going to talk about today. Preparing yourself so that you understand what you're getting into before you get into uh, the political advocacy groups. Build a, building a no-kill campaign and the tools that you will use to get there. Understanding and overcoming predictable and recurring challenges, things that are going to come up, things that people are going to say, just like they did in our community and just like they do in every community in which people have this discussion about saving lives. Knowing when you're winning, which is really exciting, it was a point that we didn't realize until it was, you know, passed. Um, and then a little bit of parting advice. Understanding the movement. So in, any, in anything that you do in life, you want to be prepared to do it. You don't want to just start and then figure out what to do. So the one thing that I recommend is to read uh, a couple, one or two or all three of Nathan Winograd's books on the subject of No Kill, because it really gives you kind of a, a Bible of where we've been, what we're up against, and where we're going. Uh, Friendly Fire is the, is the last one. Um, it's pretty, it's a quick read. I, um, I'm not exactly a quick reader, but my wife and I went to Europe for our honeymoon, and I read it on the plane uh, over there. So, you know, most people could probably read it faster than I did. But it's not that long, but it really gives you a, an idea of what we're up against. Understand the no-kill equation, which were those programs that I talked about earlier this morning, but I'll put them up again here, which are basically the proven programs and policies that have already worked in other communities that will work in your community. Again, people love to say, it won't work in my community. It can't work. I'm already doing it. And it just isn't true. If you line up the programs that have worked elsewhere and you do them again, you will save lives. Familiarize yourself with the success stories. Again, because it's so much easier to combat this negativity of, an, of inevitable impossibility if you can tell them, actually, it's already happening. Something cannot be both impossible and already happening. And they're going to tell you it's impossible, but you can say it's not impossible. It's already happening in over 200 communities in America. And then familiarize yourself with the current the kind of, I guess I shouldn't say current because it's changing so radically and so fast, but the old school methodology in animal sheltering is what 
people are going to throw at you, which is called LES, which is, I think, an accurate description, um, which is legislation, education, and sterilization. That's what they say we have to, that's the way to save lives. We need to legislate things like, you know, pet limits and leash laws and mandatory spay neuter. We need to educate people, like tell them you need to be spay neutering your pets and have like memes on Facebook telling them that they got to spay and neuter or they're horrible. Um, and then we got to uh, sterilize, you know, spay and neuter, spay and neuter, spay and neuter, spay and neuter. That's what the traditional animal welfare thinking is. You know, it didn't include, it didn't include the S until the 80s because that's when spay and neuter became much more um, routine. Before that, it was just legislate, educate, and it never say, it never worked. I, I read a book, actually it's in Nathan's book. Uh, there's a quote from a shelter director in 1910 that says, we do the best we can, we save the most adoptable animals that we can, and unfortunately, we have no other choice but to euthanize the rest. That's, you will hear it today. Like, the thinking has not changed in a lot of animal shelters in 100 years. 100 years. Think of what has happened in every other industry in 100 years. Firemen no longer work on a bucket brigade. But yet the animal shelter is still mo mostly following the same strategy they did in the late 1800s and early 1900s. The same exact strategy. Blame the public. Talk about how important, you know, the, how they are to blame for it. Talk about overpopulation. And then just save a few that you can and kill the rest. Because you have to. Because you have no other choice. That is what the other side is going to say to you. But what you're going to know, because you're here and you've read these books and you're prepared, is that that has never worked in a single community to stop shelter killing. The old strategies have never worked in a single community to stop shelter killing. What we have to do is implement the proven policies and programs that have worked in other communities. And that's the way, when you focus on programs, you really get out of this, you're a bad person thing. Because a lot of times, uh, people will say, well, our shelter director is the devil. You know, our shelter director is a horrible human being. The moment you say that to the city council, they've stopped listening to you. You know why? Because they know the shelter director. And they know the shelter director's kids and they hang out with the shelter director's boss, and they don't believe that the shelter director is an immoral person. And you've already lost them when you come in like that. But if you, instead you come in and you say, you know what, we don't have an offsite adoption program. And in Charlottesville, when they start doing an offsite adoption program, they increase their adoptions by 20%. And in Austin, when they started doing an adoption program, they saved another 2,000 animals a year. That's how you get to uh, fact-based information that is much more rational and logical and convincing rather than about a personality fight, which you're probably going to lose. Here are the programs and policies of the no-kill equation. Again, I mentioned them this morning. Feral cat trap, neuter, and release program. High volume, low cost spay, neuter. Rescue groups, foster care program. Comprehensive adoption programs, including offsite adoptions in multiple locations seven days a week medical and re behavioral rehabilitation to save the animals that need a little extra care, public relations, community involvement, uh, volunteers, proactive redemptions, meaning return the animals to their homes as much as you possibly can rather than having to rehome them, and a, comp a compassionate director. Get to know your animal welfare uh, landscape. So you want to figure out who the key players are in your community. This was one of the very first things I did. So I stepped aside and I tried to figure out who in our community was already leaders in this space. Because those are the people that are already going to be, um, people are already going to be talking to. Figure out who they are. Go meet with them. Put your, you know, shake their hands. Get to know them. Let them know, you know, make them know, understand you're a real person and you're not here to, you're not here to criticize, you're here to try to, to, to help. Um, figure out what programs, remember we had that no-kill equation, figure out what programs your shelter's already doing and which ones are not being done in your community. Because there's no reason to repeat, and re uh, to repeat the things that they're already doing. We already had massive spay-neuter resources. There was no point in us spending another dollar on spay-neuter, even though that's what they thought. We already have, Austin spends <laughs> more money on spay-neuter, I think, than any city in the country. We didn't need more spay-neuter. It wasn't working. It wasn't saving any more lives. What we needed was to save the lives of the animals that were coming into the shelter. Spay-neuter does not do anything for an animal that's already in your shelter. 
does nothing for that animal. And so, so the spay neuter game, it's great, it's part of the program, but it's not sufficient in and of itself. And it won't save a single animal that comes into the shelter doors. What's the customer service like at your shelter? I once um, was asked by a uh, city foundation to come to their city and evaluate their shelter and give them ideas for what they could do. And so on a Saturday morning, myself and representatives from this uh, foundation in suits um, walked into the front door of the shelter and immediately were screamed at, get behind the glass. I get, they thought we were going to rob them or something. I don't know. It was unclear. Um, that was customer service. That was the customer service in that shelter. Screamed at, get behind the glass. Um, they immediately thought if someone was coming into the shelter, they must be, you know, dangerous. Um, and what you have to do is flip that on its head, obviously. A sh the customer service at a shelter should be the best customer service you could possibly have. That's how you start saving lives, is you start working with the public instead of antagonizing the public and blaming them for everything. What's the budget like at the shelter? Uh, what are adoptions like? What is the intake like? Um, figure out what's going on at your shelter. Figure out, as Ellen said, remember, she put all the, the dogs and cats that were dying into categories and developed programs to save them. Well, you can't develop programs to save them if you don't know what the current programs are or which ones are dying or why. So categorize things and figure out where the holes are at your shelter. And that, in that way, you can be so much more informed and rational when you go to your city council and ask them for changes. If you don't know that they don't have an offsite adoption program, you can't go to your city council and say, look, we need an offsite adoption program, because you don't know. But if you start to know and you know where the gaps are, you become an informed advocate. And that's when you can really make changes. Commit to, OK, so the next thing. Reject excuses and pick sides. One of the things, again, in another community, a friend of mine called me and said, um, you know, in my community, there's no one willing to stand up for animals. I just told her, I said, who are you? You know, how dare you say, like, no one's willing to step up? You have to step up if no, it's not, I mean, it's you. You have you to blame if you're not the one stepping up. So step up. Be the person that commits to and engages in the democratic process. Reject excuses that will delay success. Another person I talked to, well, I'm just not in a point in my life right now where I'm willing to take that on. OK, fine. Then it's equally your fault. Because somebody's going to have to do it. And as, as long as everybody's looking around, like looking over their shoulder, looking for somebody else, then no one's going to do it. And the other thing that animal welfare advocates you know, always forget is that the vast majority of the world doesn't care about our issue. You can't, you can't expect everybody to care about animal welfare as much as you do. We now have a district system in Austin, so it's no longer everybody at large city council members. And so everybody has a district now. In, the, in their district, they have issues that they care about in their district. You know, in the poorest communities, they want to talk about food. They want to talk about pre-K for kids. And I don't blame them. Those are really important things to them. They don't want to hear about the shelter. And so you kind of have to realize that it's going to take you doing this. It's going to take you stepping up. Don't wait for someone else to decide this is really important to them. Because you might be waiting a long time. And you got to pick sides, unfortunately. Yeah, it's, I think it's impossible to do this as like that person who wants everybody to get along. You have to be able to w be willing to say, no, we've had enough of the killing. We want something dramatic to be changed here. You have to be willing to say those words, that we've had enough, that we don't want to see this killing anymore, and here are the steps to get to the other side of this. Get prepared, get ready to rumble, and change begins with you. All right. Now, building a no-kill campaign. So here I'm going to talk about some of the tools uh, and procedures and policies and things you can do that we did in Austin that really helped. Identify your goals, identify your audience for, those, for your goals, craft your message, and implement key strategies and tools. And the reason I say identify your goals is because, again, you know, whenever you're trying to work on something, figure out what it is your end goal is. It's really it's so easy to get caught up in the day-to-day -day that you forget where, you, where it is that you're, where, that you're aim, aiming to achieve. 
And one day, uh, our group met, um, the Fix Austin group, and we just kind of said, all right, at the end of today, we're gonna figure out what our goals are for the next three years. What do we wanna accomplish in Austin in the next three years? And this is the first three are what we wrote down. Become a no-kill community, which we defined as saving at least 90% of the animals. Uh, rigorous implementation of each of the programs and policies that works. Progressive, achieve, get progressive shelter leadership at our uh, municipal animal shelter, um, change regimes if necessary, get a replacement if necessary. And then at the end of it all, you can think about codifying some of the life-saving basics, um, which I won't talk about today, but if you wanna look it up, it's the Companion Animal Protection Act um, is a set of laws that have been proposed and have passed in some other communities, which basically won't make your shelter no-kill, but it'll provide a floor that will save a lot of lives. Who's your audience? And the reason I put this in here is because I've had people call me and they say, I don't even know where to begin. This horrible thing happened to me. This horrible thing happened at my shelter. I, I got a call, at, I think it was 2 a.m. one morning, and somebody said, I was volunteering to clean at my shelter today, and I stumbled across a feral cat box, and the cat was dead inside of it because the shelter had brought the feral cat in in a box and then left it there in 110 degree heat for three days. And she said, but I don't know what to do. What am I supposed to do? Who am I supposed to call? And of course, you know, they did what a lot of people did. They called the ASPCA and they called the Humane Society. And of course, both of them did nothing. And I said, well, you've got to figure out who your audience is. What is it that you want? And who is it that has the power to give you the thing that you want? And so your primary audience are the people that directly have the power to give you the things that you want. The shelter director has the power tomorrow to make changes at the shelter to start saving lives. The, the governing body of that shelter also has the power tomorrow to make changes to start saving lives. If your shelter is a municipal animal shelter, then you have a city council or a county commission who is in charge of the operations of the shelter. If you have a private animal shelter that runs your animal control, then that private animal shelter will have a board of directors. If it's a nonprofit, it will have a board of directors. And those, that board of directors has the immediate ability to make changes at the shelter. Sometimes there's a rare instance where the private animal shelter contracts with the municipality or can't county to run animal control, in which case both of them are your audience, both the city or county governing body and the board of directors at the shelter. And then you have a secondary audience, which is those who can influence the people who can directly impact life-saving. And that is the public and the press. Because when the public stands up and says, demands change, it's gonna happen. And when you get the press on your side, things can really change quickly. Crafting your message. This is so, so incredibly important. When you are talking to the press or when you are talking to city council members or when you are talking to uh, important people in your community who may be owners of large businesses, they might be a CEO at a hospital, anybody that is kind of a difference maker or a leader in your community, it's so important to understand how to craft a message. One, keep it simple. Keep it so, so simple. You know, the concept of an elevator speech, are you guys aware, you know, familiar with that concept? The concept is you need to be able to tell your whole story. By the, when you step on an elevator with somebody, by the time they step off, you want to be able to be done with it. That's how fast you need to be able to communicate your whole story to somebody that you want to help, to help you, or somebody you want to influence. So one of the things I said, for example, in keeping it simple was, under the cult current shelter management, the city has killed more than 100,000 lost and homeless pets. That tells you everything you need to know in about six seconds. Use high impact language. This decade, the city has killed, this decade, the city has killed one animal every 12 minutes. Very simple, very direct, very high impact, but yet, not rhetorical, right? There's not, I'm not saying somebody's evil. If you draw that conclusion, you drew it. I didn't tell you to draw it. One of the things they teach us in, uh, in, in effective writing, I'm a lawyer and I write, I write for a living. I write appellate briefs. And one of the things they teach us 
is that you don't want to communicate outrage. You want to communicate facts and let your audience be outraged. When you say, I am outraged, you have lost, you have handed over authority to someone else. You have handed over power. The moment you say, I am emotional, you have conceded territory to the other side because you have shown the weakness in your argument. If you say the shelter has killed an animal every 12 minutes this decade, then the audience gets to be outraged on its own. You haven't told them to be outraged. They've become outraged based on a fact that you have given them. Target your message to your goal. So figure out what it is that you want to achieve. We were fighting over where the city would uh, build its new animal shelter. And this is the sentence we came up with. If the city moves the animal shelter, even more dogs and cats will die. We wanted to come up with the simplest, simplest, easiest to say sentence that said everything we needed it to say. If the city moves the animal shelter, even more dogs and cats will die. And I want to tell you, when we talked to the press, this was a you know, two year long battle. When we talked to the press, I made sure I said this every single time. It didn't matter what the question was. That's another thing about the press. They're going to ask you all these complicated questions. I don't care what they ask you. You say what you want to say. You say what you want to be in the story. They're not your friend. They're not your, you know, you don't, you're not trying to impress them. You're trying to get a message across. You don't need to convince the press. You need to get a message across, especially television press, because they are trying to get in and out so they can move to the, another story. And they'll stick a microphone in your face, and they'll ask you a complicated question. And you say, our city has killed one animal every 12 minutes this decade. If they ask you how, what you had for lunch, you say, our city has killed 12 animals, or one, an animal every 12 minutes this decade. Because that's the sound bite that you want. When we first started the conversation about moving the animal shelter, you know, the press would have articles like activists in Austin uh, criticizing the SPCA. You know, that's the way it was, right? And when we said this over and over and over and over again, three months later, their headlines were, uh, animal lovers think that if the city moves the shelter, more, even more dogs and cats will die. They'll begin adopting your sound bites if you say them over and over and over again. There's a um, Republican strategist who's a brilliant Republican strategist at choosing language. And he said that you figure out what your talking point is, and you say it over and over and over and over and over again. And by the time you are truly disgusted because you have said that thing so many times, that's when you know it's beginning to sink in to your audience. So you figure out what your message is and you say it over and over and over again. Keep your message simple and consistent and focus on the unnecessary programs or the necessary programs and the unnecessary killing. Focus on the things that need to change. Don't focus on, don't focus on personalities or morality or infighting, focus on facts. Project professionalism, strength, and permanence. I talked about this a little bit earlier. You know, we decided very early on, we wanted to become the lobbyists for animals in our city hall. We wanted to look like lobbyists, we wanted to sound like lobbyists, we wanted to be prepared like lobbyists. Every time we went, we were dressed in business suits. Every time we went, we left them bound materials that they could keep with them afterwards that gave them even more information. Most of the time when you first get started, um, you're going to get 20 or 30 minutes with your city representatives, maybe. Sometimes you won't even get them. You'll get their staff. And so you need to be able to present everything that you want in that very short window of time. And then you want to leave them with materials so that they have the ability to both go back and figure out what it was that you were talking about and also give them more information so they can study up an issue, up on an issue. And this really is helpful to give them data and information. Now, one of the times we learned that uh, one of the groups that was lobbying against us, against No Kill, actually hired a real lobbyist to go in to talk to a city council member to tell them don't do any of those things that that group is doing, this is telling you to do. 
And the city council member, because we had spent so much time with him, um, was pushing back a little and saying, no, I think you know, this is important and this is important. And uh, that group that was hired, their lobbyist said, well, we're saving the vast majority of the animals that are coming in, so you need to listen to us. Well, we had prepared a uh, chart that had showed every group what it was saving. And our group was saving three times as many as that one. And so the city council member pulled out our pamphlet, turned to that page, turned it around, and passed it across the desk to the lobbyist. And the lobbyist said, sorry, my bad. And that's why it's so important to actually be prepared and have data and leave it with them so that they know, um, they know the truth and they know the facts and they know the details. You can have a website which I'll get into a little bit later, press releases, emails, all the other communi communications tools, keep them all professional. You know, you, can, you lose authority when you get emotional. You lose authority when you seem like you're crazed or angry. You lose power. Um, and, you know, I always know when I'm winning in court when the other side's getting angry. Like that's when I, I literally know, okay, I've got this one. When the other side is getting really angry and their voice is getting, they're getting louder and they're pounding the desk, I'm like, oh, good. I got, I got this one. I didn't realize that, but now I know. And there's something about emotional energy that is, it, it transfers power to the other side. So you need to be rational and calm and logical and professional. Talked about websites. You know, every no-kill advocacy group should have a website. Um, even in today's social media age, websites are really critical. At the very least, they show the other side that you're serious. You know, if somebody gets an email that says, there's this group, fix Austin, and uh, don't listen to them, the first thing that the audience is going to do is go check out our website, right? So you have to have a website to look legitimate. I strongly urge you to put together an email subscription list so that you can begin <clears throat> communicating your, your um, information as best you can and communicating your needs to as many people as you can as possible through email. You should have social media, but I have to tell you, Facebook especially is becoming less and less and less important um, in a, as a communications tool because Facebook has begun to dramatically decrease the number of people that your posts are being shown to. If you manage a Facebook page now, you, you, you will notice how many people actually saw it. And for most people, it is a tiny fraction of the number of people who have liked a Facebook page. And Facebook has already announced that they're going to be turning it down and down and down and down to the point where if you want an audience to be reached, you're going to have to pay Facebook to show the message that you posted to the people who have already asked to see your message. And it's only going to get worse. So um, although it's, I mean, it's important, it does get to some people, it's, it should not be a primary means to getting your message to the people that you want to get it to. Here's a good example of an a, of a advocacy website. This is King County Animal Care and Control uh, Exposed, which is a group in, <clears throat> in King County, Washington. Um, you can see some of the things on here which I think are good. Uh, homepage about us, news, frequently asked questions contact us, how you can help. I really like how you can help pages because studies have shown that most people spend less than 60 seconds on a website. If, you, if, somebody approached, if somebody went to your website, you have to get them what you need them to know very, very quickly. Again, I go back to what I was talking about earlier, which is that most people don't care about this issue as much as you do. I mean, I'm sure you've had conversations with your friends or your neighbors, and you're like, I can't believe this is going on. They're like, yeah, you're right. And then they go to their kid's soccer game. Right? Because it's just not, everybody has their own thing. That's perfectly okay. We all have things that we, we're passionate about, and other people have other things they're passionate about. And that's, that's what makes this world wonderful. But you, if you don't realize that when you are advocating, then you're failing to understand where your audience is coming from. And so one of the things, you know, get them the information they need as quickly as possible. If somebody came to your website because they wanted to help, get them the information as quickly as possible have a how you can help, make it something they can do in three minutes. Because they're not going to spend any more than three minutes on your website. They're not going to spend, most people aren't going to spend more than three minutes helping you. Here's another one. This is Justice for Bella in uh, North Carolina. And the reason I like to show this one is because it was free. They just used some software that came on their Mac, um, put it together. I also thought that it was clever to use some video um, right on the front page of their website. 
This was started by a group, uh, by a guy in North Carolina who, who his um, dogs got out while he was at dinner with his wife. And um, this police officer uh, saw the dogs and um, one of the dogs came straight up to him and he put him in the car and the other dog wouldn't come up to him. You know, there are two types of dogs, the runners and the waggy tails. <laughs> And the waggy tails come straight up to you, and then the runners are scared of you and will, you know, maybe come a little close and then dart away. And um, Bella was a runner. She wasn't, she wasn't violent. She was a runner. And so the police officer shot her and killed her because he said it wasn't worth his time to try to chase her. And they had that on video. It's pretty powerful. Advocacy tools. Um, the media is the next thing. The media is your friend, and you have to be able to use them as your friend. And they will be your enemy at times, too. But if the more that you can get them on your side, the more that they can help you spread your message to your audience. I highly, highly, highly recommend creating a media list. Go to every single media contact's website in your community and figure out what their, their uh, uh, story submission uh, email address is. Every single one will have a, do you have, you know, have an info at what, or a submit story at or something like that. And those are, they're asking for, for you to submit stories to them. You know, most people don't realize this, but television news media, there are a lot of slow days. There are a lot of days they have nothing to talk about. And they love pet stories. And so if you can give them some information, then they very well may pick up your story and run with it. And you have to know that a lot of times you're going to get ignored because there was big news day. We had some big story. We had a big story. We had a big press event. We, had all, we were so excited. We had people going down to City Hall. We had city council members. We had people bring their pets. And there was a massive accident on the interstate that, that morning. Nobody came to our press event. I think one or two people did, but the vast majority did not. That's going to happen. But that's why you have to have, give them stories frequently and maybe you're going to get one of those days where they don't have any stories and they don't have anything to do, and then they might pick up your story. So don't get discouraged when they ignore you. Just keep trying. Keep sending them stories to, to write. Develop real relationships with the media. It's the same thing with the council members. People will help you when they know you as a person. I mean, when's the last time a stranger, a perfect stranger, helped you? Pretty rare, right? But you ask one of your best friends, can you help me out with this thing? They're going to help you out relationships are what matters. The, the number one reason that people give to charities, you know what it is? They were asked. They were asked. That's why people give to charities. They were asked. If they're not asked, they go on there with their lives. They go to their kids' soccer games. They go to Chili's that night. They just do their thing. If somebody asks them individually, personally, then they give. And you have to develop those real relationships with the media. We had um, a television reporter here in Austin who was writing really nasty stories about us, really tough, negative stories. And I was hanging out with her at a, I didn't take it personally, I have in other ones, and that was a mistake, but I didn't take it, this one personally, hanging out with her before a press event, and we realized that we had a very close mutual friend in DC, somebody that I went to law school with and she was very good friends with. The moment we made that connection, her stories changed 180 degrees. And all of a sudden, everything was positive about us. That's because it's impossible. It's very, very hard to criticize someone you know personally. It's really hard. It's easy to criticize someone you don't know personally. And again, this is why when you go to uh, some place and you say our shelter director is a horrible human being, and you're talking to their boss who knows them, who's at meetings with them once a week and knows they're not a, human, a horrible human being, you, you're out. You've lost it. You've lost, authority. You've lost your moral authority. You've lost your ability to persuade. Real relationships matter. You know, get, ask them. Uh, you have a person who's in the media talking about uh, animal issues a lot. Ask them to lunch. Take them to lunch. Ask them to go have coffee with you. Tell them the full story. If they don't know the full story, they don't know what all's going on. Get to know them as a person. It got to the point where that woman that I was talking about who wrote you know, nasty stories at us first, she once called me on my cell phone and said, hey, we got a slow day. You got a story for me? And then wrote, did this awesome story about how there was no foster program at the, at the animal shelter and came to my house and interviewed me holding little baby kittens. 
The press loves baby kittens, okay? <laughs> you should learn two things from this. It's all about relationships and get baby kittens in your hands. Press releases. Um, I believe in doing professional press releases and submitting them to these info at, um, email lists from, from the press. You want a logo, develop a logo, put it at the top so that they know who it's coming from every time. Attention grabbing language, write it like a real news story. I'm gonna show you an example in a minute. But your press release should look like a newspaper story. That's what they're used to getting. And sometimes they're so lazy, they will copy and paste your press release into their story. It has happened to us. Literally, our words went into the paper as a newspaper story because people are busy. Sometimes people have too much on their plate. Sometimes it's really easy to copy and paste and put it into a story or a quote you know, from a story. Proofread it. Ask your friends. Some, ask someone else to proofread anything that you send out um, to, the, to the news media. And always be honest. The moment that you try to overclaim something or you overstretch or you stretch the truth and you get caught, you've lost credibility. It's better to tell the truth and not score as many points than it is to try to, whole bunch of try to score a whole bunch of points and have someone realize that you lied to them. Because you can only lose your credibility once. When you do, it's gone and it's really hard to get back. Whereas if you become the person that they know can tell them the truth, then you're really beneficial to the press. And what I became for many of the press back when I was doing this every day, which I'm not doing anymore, thankfully, but I became a resource. So whenever they had a question about something, they knew they could call me, and they knew they could get the truth, and they knew they, that I could direct them to somebody who could speak on that topic, whichever side it was they wanted somebody to speak on. And that's when you're really making headway, is when you become a resource for the press. And you can buy media too. You don't have to wait for the press to give it to you for free. You can buy media too. So here's one of the press releases that I was talking about. Again, our logo at the top looks and give them your contact information. Make it look like uh, a news story. See what like with the Austin, you know, TX and caps. Go to your news story. Make it look like one. Give it a headline: Thieves strike Austin, strike Austin nonprofit. Take much needed donations. Um, and then show, make it, again, look like a story. Striking a blow to Austin's no-kill efforts, uh, thieves grabbed and ran off with several hundred dollars of much-needed donations. And that, that happened, and the, the press picked this up, and when they did, someone called the newspaper and said, would you please get me in touch with that group? I want to I wanna replace all of the donations that they lost today and then double that. When you get to the public, they will help you. You just have to get to the public. This was one of the ones I showed earlier, which was an, a full-page ad. Actually, this was slightly different, but one of the full-page ads we bought. Um, in 508 BC, the Greeks invented a system that can dramatically reduce the killing of lost and homeless pets, democracy. And then you have your ask. Ask. You never want to communicate with an ask. A, a communication without an ask is wasted. You have to ask your audience to do something, and some small fraction of them will. But we learned later, we bought, we probably bought five or six full page ads. A city council told us that they had received more emails on the shelter move controversy than any other, on any other topic in the history of Austin. And nine out of 10 of the messages they received were on our side, despite the, the fact that the other side had lobbyists and were all the animal welfare stakeholders. So you can beat those others at the game. You just have to work really hard and you have to be smart. Another example of the same thing. Get involved with politics. You have to immerse yourself in the political system because that is what changes things, especially at municipalities. Establish real relationships with decision makers. Lobby and educate them. Don't forget to make the ask. Huge mistake that I made multiple times was I'd finally get a meeting with a city council member, and I'd go in, and I'd give them my spiel, and I'd be so proud of myself, and I'd walk out the door, and I'm like, they didn't commit to anything. <laughs> They're so thrilled that I left that meeting without asking for anything, because they can feel, you know, they think, well, he feels, you know, he was listened to, but I don't have to do anything, so that's great, win-win. It wasn't a win for us, because I didn't ask for anything, and so it got to the point, and it's terribly uncomfortable, but you have to do it anyway. So at the end of that meeting, you say, will you commit to putting on the council agenda an item that mandates offsite adoptions? That's what you have to do. Sometimes they'll say no. Sometimes they'll say yes. 
Sometimes they'll lie to you. But you won't get anywhere if you don't ask at the end of it. And then that's when you can begin to hold them accountable. Because you can say, two months ago, you told me you were going to get that on the council agenda. Where is it? We need it. And I mentioned earlier, we participate in elections. We, we put out council uh, candidate questionnaires that went out to our city council. You know, it's, it's, in a big city like ours, it's impossible to reach every single candidate. I think there were 70 candidates. But what we did was we talked to political consultants and we figured out which ones were most, more likely, there were serious candidates and more likely to actually um, win or be in the, the uh, runoff. And that's who we approached. So we might have approached 25 out of 70 or 30 out of 70. Um, we told them we were going to do the animal welfare scorecard, which is what we did. Um, and we rated all the candidates based on their answers and their record if they had one. We told them ahead of time, we are going to advertise this. We told them ahead of time, we're going to put it on our, we're going to send it out to our email list. We're going to put it on our website. We're going to put it on our blog. We told them ahead of time, we're going to put out a press release about this. So they know their answers are going to get distributed, and however we rate them is going to get distributed. Nobody wants a bad score on animal welfare. Nobody wants that. So here was an example of one of ours. You know, five out of five paws for the best, down to two out of five paws for one of the persons who was really mostly unsupportive of our issues. Now, there's no reason to totally trash anybody, especially if they're going to win because then you've just alienated somebody. If you know somebody's gonna win, um, there's really no, I would either leave them out or give them a little bit of benefit of the doubt because uh, you're gonna need to work with them in the future. Democracy is accessible, but you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You don't have to come up with this stuff on your own. It's all available to you. They're all, all of these tools are at, at your disposal. Most of what I went over is free. It takes effort and time, but it doesn't cost you any money. And you can do almost everything that I listed for free. Buying ads, obviously, is an exception. And relationships are everything. Relationships, relationships, relationships. All right, let's talk about some of the things you're going to hear and then some of the things that, um, uh, how you're going to deal with it. So the status quo is, is who's against you. That's who's in charge now. And this is true of all status quos. Across the board, this isn't, this isn't um, uh, limited to animal welfare. Anybody who's in charge of an arena is going to do these things. They're going to protect the status quo. They're going to protect themselves. They're going to consolidate power as much as they can. They will deny that problems ex exist. They will attack people who suggest that are, there are programs. They will redirect criticism like it's the public's fault. We have no choice but to, part, to kill animals. It's the public's fault. They will use scare tactics like there are things worse than death, as if you know, no kills asking for people to do horrible things to animals. They will claim credit when things are achieved and blame others when things are not achieved. They will falsely claim that they're already doing all these things that you're talking about. And the status quo expects you to give up and go away because that's what everyone does. I've heard countless people say, you know what, I tried that. I went to the city council meeting and I brought 10 friends and we held up signs and we gave our speeches and you know what, nothing changed. So obviously the political system is broken. That's because politicians know that most people do exactly what I just described and then when nothing changed, they give up, they assume the system is broken and they never try again. So the system is inherently built to take on that criticism and move on because they expect you to quit and go away because that's what almost everybody else does. Who has fought no-kill reforms in the past? Public officials have, shelter managers have. Um, PETA is probably the biggest opponent of no-kill reforms currently. They are um, just adamant that we shouldn't be saving lives at animal shelters. Um, in the past, the ASPCA and, the, and HSUS have fought shelter reforms, but I think the tide is turning on both of them, especially HSUS. They've really done some good things um, in, the most, in, in the recent past. ASPCA kind of talks out of both sides of its mouth. Um, you know, they talk about how they're for no-kill, and then, I don't know, a few years ago, they accidentally released their talk, like, uh, strategies that they sent to shelters, which called um, our group, no, they called Austin uh, No-Kill Association, um, uh, what was it? Um, I, f I forgot the 
description they used, but they basically said we were radicals and, try, and you know, advised shelters to undermine groups who um, talk about no-kill. Um, so they basically, you know, in one hand, publicly, they were saying, oh, yeah, yeah, we support no-kill. And then on the other side, they were sending messaging to local shelters to how to defeat no-kill efforts in your community. The uninformed press, the ones that are just going to start reacting, they're going to assume that you're wrong. They're going to assume that the shelter is doing everything that it can. And the major current animal welfare stakeholders in many communities, they're already doing everything that they think they can do or they should be doing. And when you describe things that should be different, they take it very personally. And so you should be used to and ready for them to be generally against you. Who is with you or were with you? American Pets Alive, the Nocle Advocacy Center, Nathan Winograd, uh, Maddie's Fund and Best Friends have been very, very supportive uh, of, no -kill, of the no-kill movement. The public, even though they don't know it yet, they're all for you. They all want to save lives. You talk to a person on the street and you say, should we be saving more lives at our animal shelter? And they'll say, yeah, we should. I mean, I think somebody actually did a study recently and was like, I think it was something like 95% of people thought it should be illegal to kill animals at animal shelters. The public is with you. You just have to get to them and you have to tell the public how, they, how you need help to get to where you want to be. The informed press, once you make that connection, once you tell them about other cities, once you educate the press, they'll start flipping their stories and, and writing about how great you are. That same newspaper that wrote the article about how horrible uh, Ellen and I are, they, um, they uh, more recently named Ellen the you know, best advocate in the city of Austin and talked about how great she was. They, this, again, that newspaper had talked about how horrible no-kill is and how horrible no-kill leaders are. Uh, when they endorsed Mike Martinez when he was running for mayor, they said he's respons largely responsible for Austin becoming a no-kill community, and they endorsed him for it. So the press can change. Um, don't try to get into a fight with them. Just try to keep on educating them over and over and over again. And of course, animal lovers like like you and I, and I and everyone else in this room, we're all here for you and have your back. It will be a battle. It will take time. It is a, uh, it is, it is a long journey. It is not a short sprint. It's more like a marathon than a sprint. This takes time, and you got to work it and work it and keep working it. The status quo is against you, but the system is built to give you the power to change everything. Our founding fathers, if you look at the Federalist Papers, they intended for it to be very difficult to change government. They, they intentionally created a system that was difficult to change because what they believed is that groups who kind of shot up and then went away, they called them factions, they didn't think that they should have control over power, and they knew that if they made government easy to change, that the government would swing like a pendulum in all kinds of directions. And they needed government to be more stable. So they designed government to be difficult to change. However, they designed it to be able to be changed. And so using all the advocacy tools at your disposal can help you make those changes that the system was designed to allow. Always take the high road. Stay in the game, outlast the other side. Expect to be attacked, knowing it will happen will make it easier for you to stomach. Fight back with data, logic, and righteous indignation. Know that no-kill is achievable and inevitable. It's only a matter of when, not whether. Always project strength, professionalism, and resiliency. Outwork them, wear them down, drown them out. All right, so here are the things that other, other side's going to say. They're going to say, well, it's really just pet overpopulation. I'm sure everybody has heard that term, that excuse. Well, it's overpopulation. There's nothing we can do. But you can tell them that, in fact, mathematically, that's incorrect. Mathematically, there are far more homes that acquire a pet each year than there are pets entering <coughs> animal shelters. Maddie's fund figured out it was something like 20, I think it was 21 million or 27 million, whatever the number was, people who are acquiring a pet every year, or in the market to acquire a pet every year who haven't decided where they're going to acquire it from. But there are a fraction of that of animals dying in animal shelters every year. So the question isn't overpopulation. The question is, where are people getting their animals from? And if you can change the source of animals, from being other sources to being the animal shelter, you can get to no-kill almost overnight. There's not a single peer-reviewed study. I looked and looked and looked for any actual peer-reviewed study that supported the overpopulation assumption, and I couldn't find a single one. I couldn't even find a definition of overpopulation. 
If you ask 10 people who talk about how we're overpopulated and you ask them what that means, you'll get 10 different definitions. It's really fascinating. But what you do know is that there are more animals, more people adopting animals every year, acquiring animals every year, than there are animals getting killed at shelters. They're going to say it's the irresponsible public's fault. And you're going to say, blame the public has always been an excuse, but it's never resolved the problem. I mean, it's a nice thing to say, really. It's a good sound bite, but it doesn't solve anything. It's an excuse. It's not a strategy. So what we're trying to do is get out of the excuses campaign and work on strategies and solutions. And also, you know, there is an irresponsible public everywhere. I think in New York, went no kill literally overnight. They had a new director said, we're not going to kill anymore. Do you think the public changed overnight? Of course it didn't. What changed were the strategies and solutions at the animal shelter. In 2007, we killed 14,000 animals. In 2011, we killed less than 2,000. Do you think the public changed in Austin in four years? A city of a million people? Of course it didn't. Our strategies and solutions and programs changed. They'll say you can't adopt your way out of your killing. Spay-neuter is the only solution. You'll say, of course, spay-neuter is part of the solution. It absolutely is. But in order to get to no-kill, we both have to reduce the anim number of animals that are coming in, and we have to increase the number of animals who are going out alive. And, we and it's uh, overpopulation or spay-neuter is never an excuse to turn your back on an animal that is in your possession. They'll say no-kill is too expensive. And you can say that the No-Kill Advocacy Center did a study, and what they concluded was that there was no correlation between a shelter's budget and its save rate. There were, there were shelters that had lots of money who were not no-kill. There were shelters that had a tiny bit of money and who were no-kill. What really matters is the leadership. Sure, of course, these things cost money, but there's not a direct correlation between the amount of money the shelter has and the number of lives it saved. They'll say it can't work in our community. People, I talked about this earlier. People love to blame their community. They just love it. Um, when the ASPCA first came into Austin, they, they have a representative who lives here in Austin, even though they're a New York group. And um, they, did, um, uh, they, they did their overview of Austin, Texas. This was in, back in 2006. And they said um, the, there are two huge obstacles to life saving in Austin. The Nathan Winograd supporters the no-kill people, and the Hispanic community. They love to blame people for, for the shelter killing animals. And you know what I say? No-kill programs have worked in all kinds of communities, rich, poor, rural, urban, wealthy, non-wealthy, northern, southern, small, big, everything. There's not a category of cities that doesn't have a no-kill program as, a, as an example. So, Let's stop talking about how it can't work in our community. And why are you blaming us? You know, tell, tell them that. Why are you blaming the public when all these other cities are doing it? And they got the same public that we have. They'll say, how could you? Shelter employees are doing the best they can to save lives. And you'll say, you know what? They, they probably are. They're probably doing the best they can. They're probably working very hard. I'm not talking about how hard they're working. What we're talking about is specific solutions to the problem, specific programs and policies. And all we're saying is, let's implement these programs and policies so that those good people working at the shelter can save more lives. Become a power player. I've already talked about this. Be involved in campaigns. Stick around. Build relationships with the press. Communicate and repeat clear, rational, and logical messaging. Now, what to expect when you're on the other side? The opposition stops showing up for public debates. It was really, really fascinating. So as I've mentioned, you probably figured out the ASPCA was against us becoming no-kill in Austin. They had staff members here in Austin who were lobbying against everything that we lobbied for. We would go into a meeting, and we'd see the ASPCA coming out of the meeting before we went into it. And so the ASPCA and the shelter director, the previous shelter director, and all of the major stakeholders, except for those that wanted no-kill, um, got this idea of we're going to have a public debate about no-kill. We're going to have this big public debate about it. And of course we said, bring it on. We were so excited that they had this idea of a public debate about no-kill. So we told everybody, we got it out to press, we got it out to everybody who supported it, and um, about 150 people showed up for the debate. 
citizens. Apparently, right before we were supposed to start, the other side got cold feet. And they all called each other and they said, don't go. So when we got there, it was only us. And 150 members of the public and, and city council staff members and the press. And so for two hours, we all talked about how great No Kill was. And at the end of it, the city staff person who was in charge of this said, all right, we appreciate it. We thank you very much for your participation. And one of us stood up and said, no, we want to vote. You asked for a public debate, we want to vote. The city staff member said, oh, no, 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 no. We, we don't need a, we, we understood, we got your message, we don't need anything. And somebody else stood up and said, you don't understand. You work for us, not the other way around. We're having a vote. And he said, all right, all right, all right. 150 to zero in favor of no-kill programs and policies. 150 to zero. You'll also notice, hopefully, that the shelter director, if he or she is opposed to the reforms, will move on, get reassigned, give in, do something else. Cats and dogs will start coming out of the shelter alive rather than in body bags. The movement becomes bigger than you. We've talked about this earlier today. You have to put your ego, you have to check your ego at the door. You've got to. The cities that I have noticed where no-kill has not caught on are places where somebody thinks they're the movement and they're not the movement. I mean, they asked me to do a lot of these presentations here. I'll just be honest with you. The vast majority of people probably who volunteer with Austin Pets Alive have no idea who I am, don't have any clue that I was ever involved. The vast majority of people in Austin don't have any clue who I am, what my name is, what my role was, that I had anything to do with this. That's because you have to make the movement bigger than you are. If the movement relies on a couple of people, it's going to fail. If it relies on one person, it is destined to fail. You have to let the movement be bigger than you. You have to let people come in and be you know, a big open tent and get lots of people engaged. You know, Ellen, I think, is brilliant, is the master at getting people involved. I always warn people, if Ellen Jefferson ever invites you to lunch, beware. Because you're going to leave having committed to something you had no idea you were going to commit to beforehand. But also, when volunteers come to Ellen and they say, we're not doing X, Y, and Z. We really need to be doing X, Y, and Z. And she said, you're right. You're now in charge of that program. <laughs> Hand over the reins to people. Empower people. Empower volunteers. Empower people to help. Are there going to be people who don't do it? Yeah. Let them quit, move on, and then get somebody, else, get somebody else to do it. But you cannot do this alone. And you cannot do this if you make it about you. you ha it has to be bigger than you. It has to be something more. The movement becomes far bigger than you. It will pass you up. You won't get any credit, and you will not care, because you are never in it for you. The people who achieve these things, doesn't, it can't matter who gets the credit. It cannot matter. I remember one time, um, uh, the, I think it was the chief of staff for the mayor. I went and had drinks with him one night, and he said, he's like, I have to tell you, Ryan, I know how much you've been involved in this. He said, but I have seen this over and over and over again in, across topics. And the person who starts a movement is never the person who brings it across the finish line. And it hurt. <laughs> it really hurt. Uh, but he was right. He was absolutely right. And no Kill only took off in Austin when it you know, way passed us by, the people who had kind of pushed it along at the beginning and, and, and started the momentum. It's so much bigger. It's bigger to the point where you know, Mike Martinez was running for mayor, his primary opponent who, who won. Uh, in his campaign ad, at the end of the ad, it said, oh yeah, and don't worry, we're going to keep the net shelter No Kill. That was in the primary opponent's campaign advertisement. People care about this. It is how people now define their love of the city. If you walk up to people and you say, what are the, some of the things you love about Austin? One of the things that a lot of people are going to mention is, we're a no-kill community. I love that. And so uh, it becomes very much bigger than you, and that's a great thing. But it starts with you. Don't ever forget that. It starts with you. Stop waiting for someone else to do it. It will take time. It will be a battle. You will get hurt. You will get your feelings hurt, you will be attacked, but you'll prevail if you work hard enough, smart enough, and long enough, and if you don't give up when everyone else expects you to. Success goes to the people who work harder 
and longer and smarter than everyone else. You don't have to be all powerful. You don't have to be everywhere. You don't have to be rich. You just have to make everybody think that you're powerful and rich and organized. And you can do all of these things to present that image. Last parting advice. This is a quote that I loved from Martin Luther King. He said, we must combine the toughness of the serpent and the softness of the dove, a tough mind and a tender heart. And I think that perfectly encapsulates you know, what, what we are as a movement. We have to be tough. We have to fight hard. But we have to understand that at the very base of it, at the, at the core of it, is a movement about love and compassion. And when we keep those two things in our head at the same time, that we got to fight, but at the same time we got to love, I think that's when we find that we can reach our goals. So thank you very much, and do you have any questions? <laughs>